God will make a way. There's nothing that's going to happen today, tomorrow, or the next day that you and God can't handle. Nothing. God will always make a way. That's an incredible way to approach life, isn't it? Ooh, I should have preached on that today. <laughs> Wish I'd have known you were going to sing that song. Well, our lectionary text today is for this fifth Sunday after Easter is uh, John chapter 13, two verses, 34 and 35. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. God help us now as we focus our attention on this text and my thoughts about it. Would you come and enrich our hearts? God, the text says that everyone in this world is going to know who the Christians are by the fact they love each other. And we haven't done a very good job of that. We, ha- we haven't done well at following this command. So help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you might read that and say, oh no, another command <laughs> out of all those I've already read. <laughs> well, you know, The laws, the commands that God gives us are the laws of being. God created us. He knows all about us. Uh, He he knows how he wired us together, how we're supposed to live, and how we're supposed to relate to one another if we want to have life to the full, as Jesus said, or, or, uh, or more abundantly. So if we want that life, we have to follow the owner's manual, don't we? Amen. How do you, when you go get a new car, how do you figure out how you turn the lights on it? You look at the owner's manual. And uh, this is your earth suit owner's manual. It tells you in here how you're supposed to live and relate to one another in this world. The laws of God are not given to restrict us but to free us to live as God designed. The law is God's gracious gift to us to to show us how we can have full and abundant life. Now, the Old Testament standard uh, in human relationships was justice and righteousness. You act justly, fairly with people, and, uh, and, and then you do what is right. Righteousness means that you fulfill the demands of the relationships that you're in. So justice and righteousness. Now Jesus expands that standard. He said you're to love each other. Now this is not love as we commonly understand that word. Uh, We are to love as Jesus loved. And the word there all through this text is the word agape, the Greek word agape, which is most often used for the love of God. This is divine love. It's, It's love that humans aren't capable of without the Spirit living in them. We're to love with divine love. Well, what does this divine love look like? How does it behave? And the simple answer is... Title to the sermon, Love Like Jesus. The same way that he loved. He was the example of what? We are to love like Jesus. So today what I want to do is just share with you some things about divine love that lives in each and every one of us and how that divine love is to relate to the people around us, particularly in the household of God, but also into the world around us. You know, one, one of the hardest things I've been having to do uh, the last uh, few weeks, really, is to pray that Vladimir Putin would get saved. 
that he would come to know God, that God would visit him in the night. You know, I want God to just, you know, <laughs> just make him go away, poof him out, you know. But really the thing God would really like to see is to see Putin come to the Lord. Amen. He is a baptized supposed believer in the Eastern Orthodox Church, I understand. And uh, he's around some things of God and and obviously he hadn't, uh, he, he's not following God in, in any way I can see. So let's just look at some characteristics of divine love. First, divine love, first of all, number one, takes the initiative. Takes the initiative. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, or he sent his only son. We can love only because God first loved us. And Jesus said one time, said, if you're at the altar, and you, come, you don't come to the altar and, and give your offering uh, to God, and there you remember that someone has something against you, so just leave your offering there and go be reconciled to that person and then come back and make your offering. In other words, God not, doesn't receive your offering when you got hate in your heart. Be reconciled with people. Take the initiative. Take the initiative. Jesus did not say, Build you a nice church building, put a sign out front, says fish wanted. What did he say? He said, get your pole, get your net, and go fishing. Go out there in the highways and byways and get them in here. We got a lot of pews. Y'all need to get to work. The Great Commission, I hope everybody knows what the Great Commission is. The Great Commission is what Jesus told the disciples before he left. In, in Matthew 28, it's best expressed. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Well, all of that is inherent in the command to love. Knowing God and his truth without sharing it with others is inconsistent with the very definition and nature of divine love. That divine love always takes the initiative. You know, the, 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 the best comparison I could make, what would you think of Harold if he figured out a way to cure cancer and didn't tell anybody? We'd probably rough him up, wouldn't we? <laughs> Good Lord, what's, why? Well, let me tell you something. Sin is as deadly as any disease. In any cancer that anybody has ever had, sin is more deadly and it's more certain. And you've got the cure. His name is Jesus. Don't keep it to yourself. Divine love takes the initiative and goes. Well, divine love, number two, is honest. It's honest with folks. You know, we have this silly notion that love tolerates all things, never offends, and keeps the beloved from all struggle and discomfort. Well, I don't know about you, but God had not treated me that way. <laughs> divine love is not, divine love is honest. Sometimes confronting. You remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees? He didn't say, well, you know, God loves you. Everything's going to be all right. It'll, it'll be okay. Everything's going to work itself out. Rather, he said in Matthew 23, 33, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? He was honest. He told them the truth because he loved them even though that truth was hard and it made them mad at him. But it's what they needed to hear. He warned them of error they were involved in because he loved them. And Jesus says to us, love others as I have loved you. Don't be afraid to share Christ with your uh, relatives who, who are, are lost and in the world. 
I heard people say, well, I don't want to run them off. Well, you know, run them off, they're not here anyway. Go ahead and share Jesus with them. Invite them to come. Divine love, number three, is forgiving. Now, don't confuse convic- con- uh, forgiving with tolerance. God is not a soft-hearted grandfather who lets us get away with murder. He's not that way. God is holy, and he calls us to be holy. Matter of fact, he demands that we be holy. Now, 1 John 1, 9, 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But remember that uh, repentance is inherent in confession. Recognizing your sin and coming to God. Repentance, which is turning away from that sin and turning to God, is inherent in confession. And repentance is not just feeling sorry for yourself. Most of the time we we say, well, we're sorry for our sin, but what we're really sorry for is the sin got us in a mess. We're not sorry for the sin, we're sorry for the mess that it caused. And it's not just feeling sorry. Repentance implies active change. Active change. Now, we don't earn forgiveness by repentance. Forgiveness is given as a gift. But we must appropriate it. We must receive it by turning to God. Which, you are turning to God, go pick it up, it's yours. He's giving it to you. It means turning away from sin to holiness. Turning away from darkness to the light. It means turning from evil and doing good. It means turning from hate to love. It means uh, turning away from revenge to forgiveness. Jesus looked down on the cross to those who had beat him, spit on him, put a crown of thorns on his head and abused him in every way you can think of and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said that because he loved them. And Jesus said to us, love others as I have loved you. Divine love number four is selfless or you could say humble. God is perfect within himself. God does not need anything else to be complete, fulfilled, content, and happy. God's very being is life in completion and fullness. He doesn't need anything else. He only needs us because his plan requires us. God stands to gain nothing by extending love to us. Selflessness is loving without any expectation in return. Read Philippians 2, 5, 11 this afternoon when you get a few minutes. Paul tells us there that Jesus did not even consider his equality with God. Didn't even consider it, but he left it behind and he emptied himself into this earth for us. He put his own interest aside for us. He put put our needs above his own. And Jesus says to us, love others as I have loved you. Divine love number five is sacrificial. It, it, just, it has no limits. If it meant the cross, Jesus was prepared to go there. And he did go there. He was under no compulsion to do that, except the compulsion that comes from love. Remember when he said to the disciples, don't put away your sword. Don't you know that I've got 10 legions of angels at my disposal any minute? I can stop all this. No one took the life of Jesus 
but with sacrificial love, he gave his life willingly of his own volition. His love for the Father and his love for humanity is part of Father's creation. For no other reason for that love he came. So Jesus, of his own, own choosing, was obedient to God's plan unto death, and even death on the cross, which is not a very pleasant way to die, as you well know. 1 John 2.2 2 says, He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Isn't that great? But read the rest. And not only for ours, but also the sins of the whole world. Well, there's a whole bunch of world out there that doesn't know that. They need you to come tell them. The incarnation said that God was willing to know and endure our pain in order to make redemption available to us. Divine love compelled Jesus to give his own life so that we might have life. And Jesus says to us, love others as I have loved you. Divine love, number six, is understanding. Contrary to some modern thinking, <laughs> love is not blind, not real love, not divine love. Jesus doesn't love us because he doesn't know what we're like or because we always get it right or because we don't have any warts. He understands us perfectly. He knows us better than we know ourselves and he loves us anyway, warts and all. Amen. Now his love wants to change us because he knows that's what's best for us, but it is extended to us prior to any change. You don't have to change one thing to come to God. Just come. Come as you are. Isn't that what the words of the song? Come as you are. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love for in this, in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. And Jesus says, love others as I have loved you. Well, you might say that all those things are fine for Jesus, but surely such is not expected of us. I mean, are we even capable of that? We know we are by nature selfish and greedy, seeking to fulfill our own destiny, looking after, you know, number one, first. But Jesus did say, love others as I have loved you. And he made it clear it wasn't a suggestion. He said, a new command I give you. Not a new suggestion, a command. Now he would not say that if we weren't capable of doing it. He wouldn't demand it of us. By the new birth, the love of God is poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. That's what the scripture says. We receive a new and divine nature enabling us to love one another. And to love is the expression or the manifestation that the divine nature has indeed been implanted in us. Now that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, Unless a man is born again, he can't even see the kingdom of God, much less enter into it. You've got to be born again. You know, John, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he preached on the new birth very often. And on one occasion, someone in the congregation after the service was over they were standing around talking and someone said, Mr. Wesley, why do you trouble us so much with this text? You must be born again. And Wesley looked at him and said, because you must be born again. It's got to happen. 
or nothing's going to change. In the new birth, we receive the spirit of love. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God because God is love. Amen. Not my words, the words of the Apostle John. Through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we receive power to love others even as Jesus loved us. And if we do not love as Jesus loves, there can only be two possible reasons. One, we've not been born of the Spirit. We've not been born again, so the love of God doesn't live us, therefore we're not capable of it. Or B, we're resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We don't want to do that. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we keep our freedom of choice. Uh, we, we are made in the image of God, which means we have free will. We can do or not do. We can obey, not obey. We can receive God and follow God, or we can reject Him and run away from Him. God inhabits us only by our invitation and cooperation. God respects our freedom. Living life subject to the control of the Holy Spirit is a voluntary decision that we make. Paul did not say, get filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, be filled. It's something you have to do. You have to receive the Spirit and, and believe that God has put His Spirit in you. We tend to think of love as an emotion. And it is that. But it's more than that. At least divine love, agape love is. Uh, love is an act of our will. You know, and that means you can love someone even if you don't like him. And, and I, quite frankly, I I'm, I'm still have some people that I'm loving by faith. And, and maybe I don't feel any love for them. But that's usually a short-term con condition if you're in a, in a place where you can love someone. You're in, in a place where you see them and be around them. Uh, my, my friend and mentor, Dr., the late Dr. Jim Kilgo, y'all probably heard me uh, speak of him before. He was an English professor at the university and uh, was the guy that led me into this present walk with, with Jesus. And uh, he had a professor in his department over there that was uh, very ornery and universally disliked. You didn't have to go very far to find somebody who didn't like him because nobody liked him, but he knew. And he had some kind of handicapping condition. I, I don't know what it was, if it was a progressive illness or, or something, but anyway, he struggled, particularly getting up and down steps and that kind of thing. And uh, may, maybe that was the reason for his orneriness. Every how you say that. But anyway, uh, one day Jim was going to class, he was going up the steps, and this guy was over on the side with the rail struggling to get up to the steps and people were going around him and he passed him and he called to Jim and said, would you help me? And, uh, well, <laughs> what a whole lot he could do about it. I mean, he was, he, everybody knew he was a Christian. He'd made that clear. So what do you do if you're a Christian and somebody asks for help? Well, he grudgingly Love the man by helping him get up the steps and get to his office. But Jim said that in that process, something began to change. And they got into the man's office and he invited Jim to sit down and they, they talked for a few minutes. And Jim said, you know, for, for no reason that I, that I can put my finger on, uh, I didn't dislike him anymore. I, I, I began to like him. 
So he was no longer loving him out of obligation anymore or command. He actually felt love for the man. And I, I believe it works that way. Love begins to solve a lot of problems when it's given and received. So we are given what I call the mandate to love. It's in 1 John 4, 7 and 8. The apostle writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. 